I will introduce our next speakers. So for session three here, we have Shana Miners on, who is Cal Recycled Greenhouse Gas Reduction Unit. She works for the Department of Resources and Recycling and Recovery. And her colleague, Alex Rosado, who's the Environmental Scientist in Cal Recycle Statewide Technical and Analytical Resources, or that stands for STAR, Statewide Technical and Analytical Resources, STAR Division. Um, so they are gonna talk to you about Cal Recycle, how does climate affect our food system? Um, how is this larger picture really connected to what we're doing in food recovery? So I will stop sharing screen and take it away for Alex and Shana, who are gonna share their screen. Thank, thank you so much, Shelley, for that introduction um, and for inviting us to speak here today about climate and hunger. And um, hopefully you can see our slides now. Um, per that intro, my name is Shana Miners, and I'm a grant manager uh, in that greenhouse gas reduction unit at the California Department of Resources Recovery and Recycling, um, also known as CalRecycle. And I am here presenting uh, with my colleague, Alex Rosado, who is an environmental scientist um, in that branch affectionately known as STAR. Um, thank you so much for inviting us here today. Alex serves as technical lead on CalRecycle's food waste prevention and rescue grants, and is part of the team helping to implement California's short-lived Climate Pollutant Act, uh, known as Senate Bill, or SB 1383. I work uh, more directly with grantees, administering their greenhouse gas reduction grants, um, in particular in the Food Waste Prevention and Rescue Program, in the Pilot Reuse Program, and I'm also program lead for the Community Composting Grant Program. Um, so this topic is very apropos because both climate change and hunger have been on the minds even of lay people just you know, living their lives and taking in some of the news for the past couple of years as the landscape um, we work in has changed so much. We get three days feeling like even sunny California didn't used to be quite this warm and see that confirmed by news articles describing record breaking hot temperatures. We diligently follow agency recommendations and we plan our family's go bags in case of evacuations for fire and in some years and in some places floods. And then we read how climate models predict continued increases in the severity and frequency of fire and extreme weather events. So people who aren't scientists and don't consider themselves environmentalists have found themselves thinking more about climate. Um, similarly, people who, unlike those at this conference um, and in this field, don't work in community food systems and who never even thought scarcity could reach them or those close to them, they have found themselves thinking more about hunger. Supply chain has become even a household term to just casual readers noticing some items or ingredients are harder to get or have longer wait times, uh, some of which is related to the global COVID pandemic. And um, as everyone here knows, as many people have lost income or employment from fallout, a combination of hunger and safety concerns has meant that long lines of cars at food bank distributions have reflected this increased need, even to casual passersby. So those of us able and allowed to have worked safely sheltered from home or as distanced as possible in offices, while grocery store clerks and all of you and staff volunteer and national and even National Guard members at food banks have continued just along with workers in the fields and food factories have kept all of their essential tasks contributing to feeding all of us. So this was whether they were having to race, face risks from COVID, heat, smoke, or on uh, some days a combination of all of these. Um, next slide, please. So looking beyond these daily experiences and the headlines from these crisis situations has prompted deeper questions of how we organize society, how we organize feeding ourselves and each other, and also managing waste in a changing climate. So Alex and I are excited to get to share some information, resources, and statewide context in response to that interest and can to that conversation today. To that end, we're going to have a high level overview summary of aspects to California climate policy in a nutshell with particular attention to Senate Bill or SB 1383, since that's on a lot of folks' minds. We will go into the role power cycle plays in California climate strategy with regards to food. We'll go over some funding opportunities that we'll hope will be of particular interest to some of you moving forward, and also show some highlights from some funded projects right in the San Diego region. Then we'll have time for questions and answers, um, and maybe a bit of a conversation about how the hunger and climate efforts can reinforce each other. We will leave our contact information 
So if we aren't able to answer your questions today or if we don't know the answer, we can stay in touch and get you the information you're looking for or in touch with the right people who can help you. Next slide. California is a large and population and complex economy. This vision for the California strategy for addressing climate change as a whole is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 40% below 1990 levels by 2030. This is for emissions of all greenhouse gases, which are the pollutants that lead to climate change. Greenhouse gases include carbon dioxide, which you've probably heard about, um, and other gases, including methane, which you may or may not have heard about, but we'll hear more about today. And this vision is spelled out in California's climate change scoping plan. Next slide. So there are several aspects to achieving this plan to reduce California's emission from several sectors. These include increasing renewable electricity, reducing vehicle gasoline use, doubling buildings energy efficiency, reducing short-lived climate pollutants, which is what we're going to talk the most about today, and also to safeguard California. What is this last one mean? Well, it is critical that California continue to take steps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in order to avoid the worst of the projected impacts of climate change. The headlines can be gloomy, but it is not too late to take steps to improve the likely outcomes. And this is vital and urgent work. At the same time, it is important to take steps to take care of each other and stay safe. I've heard accounts today from some efforts to meeting people where they're at and providing trauma-informed services, as well as to shifting our thinking to assist both with emergency services and also those with chronically unmet needs. So the state also prioritizes steps to safeguard California residents to make the state more resilient to ongoing and projected climate change. So all of these parts of addressing climate change that I just listed are important. But today we're going to focus on reducing short-lived climate pollutants through recovering food for its important use of feeding Californians and also reducing food waste. Next slide. So Alex and I are both government state employees. There are all kinds of efforts to address climate change and to build sustainable communities from all the sectors of society, from nonprofits, private business initiatives, schools, and families and individuals. Our work and what we are most familiar with is authorized by the state. So I'm very briefly going to note just three key pieces of legislation because you may hear them referenced other places in conversations about climate change and also by us today. So Assembly Bill 32, the Global Warming Solution Act of 2006 was groundbreaking landmark legislation that set California's first greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals. Senate Bill 32, the Global Warming Solutions Act of 2016, extended the goals of AB 32, along with the executive order process. And you have probably already heard about um, Senate Bill 1383, even if you weren't listening earlier today when it was mentioned, which is the Short-Lived Climate Pollutants Reduction Act, also of 2016. This is the most significant waste reduction mandate to be adopted in California in 30 years. It sets statewide goals of reducing certain greenhouse gases and for recovering food and preventing organic waste, which isn't only food waste from getting to landfill. Next slide. So as I mentioned, there are many roles needed for California to achieve its climate goals. This is not only from all those sectors of society, but even within state government from various agencies. Roles for cow recycle include reducing organic waste disposal, recovering edible food from waste streams so that food stays out of the landfill, and whenever possible can achieve a really important purpose of feeding people and also reducing methane emissions. Two tasks cow recycle does wearing these hats while playing these roles is that we're, that we're going to discuss today include implementing SB 1383 regulations and administering related climate funding programs. So before we get too deep into that, you might be unclear what methane emissions, that's a methane molecule right up there, have to do with food systems or food recovery or any of your work at food banks. So to explain that, as well as more about SB 1383, I will turn the presentation over to my colleague, Alex Rosano. Thank you, Shana. Yep, so I'm gonna start off with the short-lived climate pollutants. 
Uh, so carbon dioxide levels often get the most attention when climate change is discussed, but short-lived climate pollutants actually play a large role as well. The, though they don't last as long in the atmosphere, they actually have a higher heat dropping potential in a shorter period of time. Methane is responsible for about 20% of the current net global climate forcing. And in California, about half of the methane emissions come from dairy and livestock manure or organic waste streams that are landfilled. For organic materials to decompose, they need oxygen and landfills with their low oxygen anaerobic environments aren't exactly conducive to this. Since they take longer to break down, this type of decomposition produces methane gas in a way that it wouldn't if the organic waste was being composted. So this slide gives you a picture of the total disposed waste in California and why we focus on organics, food waste prevention, and food recovery. This data is from CalRecycle's 2018 facility-based waste characterization. And organic materials defined in 1383 include green material, food scraps, wood, paper, carpet, and textiles. And altogether, they account for more than 50% of California's disposed waste stream. And it's hard to tell the way that this graph is set up, but food is actually the single largest component of California's disposed waste. The other categories like paper include things like mixed paper and cardboard, whereas food is only food. Food and non-organic organic waste, non-food organic waste make up about 34% of California's disposed waste stream. So in relation to organic waste, SB 1383 has three main goals, a 50% reduction in statewide disposal from the 2014 level by 2020, a 75% reduction in statewide disposal from the 2014 level by 2025, and a 20% statewide edible food recovery goal by 2025. Increasing food waste prevention, encouraging edible food rescue, and expanding the composting and invest digestion of organic waste throughout the state will help reduce the methane emissions from organic waste being currently disposed in California landfills. As Shana mentioned, food rescue has the added benefit of assisting Californians who are unable to secure adequate healthy food by diverting edible food to local food banks and pantries. Landfills actually emit the majority of man-made man methane emissions in California, and before 2020, one in eight Californians struggled with food insecurity. This statistic has only worsened during the COVID-19 crisis to one in four and led to mile long lines at food banks across the state. I do wanna make a note that edible food means food that is intended for human consumption. Edible food is not solid waste if it is recovered and not discarded. Nothing in this requires food or requires or authorizes food to be recovered that was not already meeting the food safety standards in the California Food Retail Code. So while California was tasked with developing regulations to meet 1383's goals, jurisdictions, edible food generators, and food recovery organizations and services play the largest role in meeting these goals. Related to the organic goals, jurisdictions are required to develop and maintain a list of food recovery organizations and services in their jurisdiction. Educate commercial edible food generators on the requirements. Increase access to food recovery organizations. Increase edible food recovery capacity if needed, as well as monitor commercial edible food generator compliance. As you can see here, commercial edible food generators are split into two categories, tier one and tier two. Tier one generators are wholesale food vendors, food service providers, grocery stores, and supermarkets. Many of these generators already donate food or have food that is easier to donate since it's prepackaged or already accepted. Tier two generators are restaurants, hotels, local education agencies, large venues and events, state agencies with cafeterias and health facilities. These generators generally have already prepared food and though they don't have to be compliant by 2024, Working towards this now will make a big difference because anyone who rescues food knows that prepared food is a bit harder to deal with. 
Both tiers of generators are required to recover the maximum amount of edible food that would otherwise be disposed and to arrange for food recovery through a contract or written agreement with the food recovery organization or service that will collect the edible food or that will accept food that the generator self holds. Although SB 1383 requires mandated food donors to donate the maximum amount of their edible food that would otherwise be disposed, it does not require food recovery organizations and services to participate. If they do decide to participate, they are required to keep records of the total pounds of food they collect from their donors, as well as report these pounds to the jurisdictions that they belong in, physically are located in, and reporting does not have to include donor names. So CowCycle has come up with a couple tools and resources for jurisdictions and food generators and food uh, recovery services and organizations. And I've listed a couple on the screen, including model contracts, guidance on how to identify edible food generators, a recovery capacity planning calculator tool, estimating how much edible food is currently being disposed by mandated food donors, as well as a customizable food recovery capacity survey. And these are all available on our website, which if anyone wants links to them, you can uh, email us and we can send them to you. Now back to Shana. Thank you, Alex, for that explanation of the science as well as of SB 1383. So sometimes government employees might be tired at the end of the day and have a friend or a family member comment at dinner how hard we must have been working for California taxpayers. We do work very hard for the benefit of Californians. But the awarded grant programs I work on haven't mostly been directly funded by yours and my tax dollars. Um, and I'm talking about these because in addition to its role related to SB 1383, Cal Recycle also plays a role in California climate strategy administering certain climate grant funds. So instead of being funded directly by yours and my tax dollars, the greenhouse gas reduction grants I have worked on have utilized funds from the California Climate Investments or CCI, which is a statewide initiative that puts billions of dollars from something called cap and trade to work um, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, also for strengthening the economy and improving public health and the environment, particularly in disadvantaged communities. So that this is called cap and trade, refers to the fact that this program is funded by entities that emit pollution for that little graphic that you can see there above a certain level or cap and then pay into this fund. The idea behind this is to create financial incentives for industries to invest in cleaner technologies and develop innovative ways to reduce pollution and then also funding positive programs that mitigate pollution. California climate investment projects um, are not only food, they include affordable housing, renewable energy, public transportation, zero emissions vehicles, environmental restoration, sustainable agriculture, recycling, and others. At least 35% of these investments are made in disadvantaged communities and low-income communities and households. The California climate investments are financial programs throughout the whole state and administered by various state agencies and not only power cycle to fund projects um, across all sectors, including water, energy, air, transportation, and waste management. So Cal Recycle CCI grant programs are not continuously appropriated, which means that funding for awarding new cycles is not guaranteed from year to year. Next slide. So Cal Recycle has developed five grant programs that so far have been funded by CCI which divert materials from landfills in an effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, particularly methane. So these programs are as following. The Organics Grant programs funds larger scale composting and anaerobic digestion projects diverting organic waste. In case you aren't sure what those mean, um, composting is the process of controlled breaking down of organic materials, such as leaves, twigs, grass clippings, and of course food scraps, resulting in a useful amendment for soil fertility and water retention. If you garden or know any gardeners or your organization has any community gardens, you'll be familiar with compost. So aerobic means with oxygen and the anaerobic digestion are referred to refers to the breaking down of the organic material without oxygen or with little oxygen, which can happen naturally in marshes and wetlands 
or in controlled environments um, for multiple purposes, but including to reduce the volume of solid waste to be landfilled. The Recycled Fiber Plastic and Glass Grant Program funds intermediate commodities and recycling manufacturing projects, which diverts fiber, plastic, and glass from the landfill. The Food Waste Prevention and uh, Rescue Grant Program funds projects to rescue edible food and prevent food waste, which would have otherwise gone to the landfill. So food waste prevention refers to preventing food waste through efforts and processes that prevent the excess food from occurring in the first place, such as by implementing software or accounting practices to prevent overproduction, overordering, et cetera. As Alex alluded to, the food rescue part of the program refers to edible food that meets all applicable health and safety standards. It's not really food waste per se, rather it is food um, that otherwise would become, become waste and then go to landfill. Our newest program is the Reuse Grant Program, which funds reusable food service wear, packaging, transportation, and wood salvage projects, displacing single use items from being used. And finally, the Community Composting for Green Spaces Grant Program funds community-based composting projects that divert organic waste on a smaller scale basis than in the organics program. So far, there's only been one cycle of the reuse program and one cycle of community composting program grants awarded. So those are our newer programs. Of these, today we will mostly talk about the food waste prevention and rescue program, since that is the most directly applicable to most of your work. And we will also touch on the compost program. Next slide. So the eligible costs um, that can be grant funded vary across each grant program and even from different years funded. For food waste prevention and rescue, Cal Recycle has typically funded in projects involving vehicles, refrigerators, software, personnel, or food-related equipment and materials. Purchasing vehicles, such as refrigerated trucks, allows grantees to pick up and transport more food from where there's an excess of food that would have otherwise gone to a landfill to where it is needed. Buying cold storage systems, like refrigerators and freezers, allows grantees to safely store more rescued perishable food for longer without it spoiling, so um, they can feed more people. Implementing software systems can allow businesses to more closely track, order, and produce what will be used, thus reducing food waste. It can also allow food rescue organizations to be more efficient with the logistics, allowing grantees to be more effective at tracking, rescuing, and distributing edible food. Earlier today, we heard about the importance of um, high quality tracking to create high quality data to be most effective um, across all the programs that we do. So you all do incredible work in your communities and very little of it can be done without skilled people power. Funding for personnel expenses can allow grantees to implement these projects. So in addition to the big ticket items such as fridges and trucks, purchase of other items such as shelves, pallet jacks, scales, or ovens can allow grantees to store, move around in a warehouse, track, and prepare more rescued food more effectively to get it to more hungry people and keep it out of the landfill. These are just some general examples, not a full list of every possible eligible expense. You should always look at the specific requirements of allowed expenses for any grant funding you are considering applying for. I will now turn the presentation back over to Alex, who will start us off talking about some of the funded food waste prevention and rescue projects awarded right in the San Diego area. Thank you, Shana. So over four cycles of the food waste prevention and rescue grant, seven grantees in the San Diego County have been awarded grant funds. We wanted to take this time to highlight a couple of those projects. Uh, some of these grantees have been awarded in multiple cycles, but uh, we'll go over some of those details. So the first one we wanted to cover was Produce Good, which is a nonprofit headquartered in Oceanside that works with both commercial and non-commercial food generators across San Diego County. They rescue unwanted and unsold produce in order to mitigate waste and supply nonprofit organizations that serve food insecure individuals throughout San Diego County. Produce Good is a unique grantee in that it was primarily a gleaning project and grant funds help pay for vehicle to transport food, uh, increase program development, as well as gleaning supplies. And in cycle one, they rescued 295,397 pounds of food. 
And in cycle three, they rescued 102,757 pounds. And this came from farmers markets, growers, and nonprofits. They also worked with the Urban Corps of San Diego. And some, in some of these pictures, you can see some of the um, equipment that they purchased, including their van, crates, picking equipment, and some of the bags that they used to hold uh, the produce, as well as a picture of them tabling at an event to talk about their program. Feeding San Diego's grant project is an example of a grantee collaborating with partners to increase food rescue. The grant funded the expansion of its existing food rescue and distribution programs. The grant funded the expansion um, of the programs by using grant funds to purchase multiple vans for use across San Diego County to increase the quantity of food rescue. You can see one of the vans pictured in that beautiful picture there. The grant funds were also used to equip partner agencies with several pieces of refrigeration equipment, improving the food storage capacity of the whole food rescue network in the region. So while entities can apply by themselves, sometimes working in formal collaboration with others allows the project to take on an even bigger scale or be even more effective. It depends on the project, whether or not the lead grantee would wanna include other official grant participants. So there are a lot of factors to consider and as always look at the specific requirements of any grant you are considering applying for. This project rescued 2,208,283 pounds of food from grocery stores, growers, and small businesses. The project also funded several positions. Um, and the, the next slide, you can see some of the uh, cold storage equipment that was purchased, as well as some of the food distribution efforts in the community by Feeding San Diego. San Diego Food System Alliance launched their Smart, Smart Kitchen San Diego, a partnership with the Jacobs and Cushman San Diego Food Bank and Lean Path to provide tools and technical assistance to 15 large food production facilities in San Diego County to reduce food waste and donate edible food. The food production facilities were matched with selected agencies with the capacity to accept donations and feed hungry people supported by additional trucks and refrigeration. They also launched the Save the Food San Diego Eco Challenge, an innovative social competition combining data-driven food waste tracking challenges with a consumer education campaign. They partnered with Colcom, San Diego Gas and Electric, University of San Diego, CSU San Marcos, City of Chula Vista, and the County of San Diego to sign up 887 participants to measure their food waste at home and participants actually exceeded the grant project goal of 10% reduction in their household level food waste. The pictures on the right show San Diego Food System Alliance tabling at one of their partnered sites to try to get some people to sign up, as well as the scales that they used uh, at home to track their food waste. Here's one of the vans that they purchased for their Smart Kitchens program, as well as some participant provided pictures of food waste that they measured at their homes. Thank you, um, Alex, for the, a great example of a food waste prevention program. A lot of us are a little more familiar with food rescue, so that's one example of what food waste prevention could look like. I had the privilege as working as Cal Recycle Grant Manager with Jewish Family Services of San Diego on an example of a grant project that included a more efficient vehicle. It may have occurred to you while listening today that gasoline powered vehicles and refrigerators are associated with greenhouse gas emissions. So the environmental scientists always need to evaluate projects and make sure there's a net greenhouse gas emissions benefit from the amount of food kept out of a landfill for a project to qualify for these type of climate grants and be successful. So environmentally preferable purchasing is important. When needing to buy a new vehicle, choosing a hybrid or electric is a way to lessen the emissions impact from the purchase of that new vehicle. Jewish Family Services San Diego used grant funds to purchase a hybrid truck for its food rescue work. They also used grant funds to purchase cold storage, including refrigeration and a flash freezer. These purchases allowed them to transport and also extend the shelf life of rescued perishable food and to rescue 780,334 pounds of food from grocery stores and small businesses. You can see their vehicle and cold storage in that picture. The second slide um, of this photo highlights 
Jewish Family Services of San Diego's work at food distribution out in the community. So we have focused on the food waste prevention and rescue grants, um, since that's the most obviously connected to all of your work. Um, but I did also want to take a moment and note another program that might be of interest, which is community composting. So while food waste prevention projects prevent waste from being created, and food rescue projects rescue edible food that would have otherwise become waste and gets that edible food to hungry people, even after all of that, waste still happens. There are in edible leftovers from food not fit for human consumption. There are also organic waste from yards, et cetera, and composting is one way to turn this waste into a boon for the community. The Community Composting Program is a much newer program than the Food Waste Prevention Rescue Program and designed to do a few things related to those waste types at the community scale. So it is designed to lower greenhouse gas emissions by increasing the number and efficiency of community composting sites throughout the state promote community-based activities to increase organic material diversion in disadvantaged and low-income communities. And there are also a lot of educational opportunities with composting at the community scale. Um, another uh, goal that the program is designed to do is to promote community-based activities to increase organic material diversion um, and reduce the food and organic waste disposed in landfills. And at the end, of all of that, there is the end product of compost, and so it is designed to provide compost to enhance community gardens, grow fresh produce, and support neighborhood climate adaptation projects. Next slide. So Cower Cycles only funded one cycle for community composting so far. Um, the Community Composting for Green Spaces program, which is the official name of that cycle one, awarded $1,540,045 to the People, Food, and Land Foundation in their capacity as the fiscal sponsor of the California Alliance for Community Composting. This grant funding was used to create compost sites all across California to divert organic waste, to launch a comprehensive California community composter training program and certification standards supported by an expert national advisory group to develop data collection and information sharing and to empower communities that have shouldered disproportionate environmental justice burden. So this project um, is still in process, but it's already begun creating compost and it has completed the training retreat for site operators and are finalizing site plans and budget proposals to launch the remaining of their 120 sites statewide from Klamath to San Diego. So all of you know where San Diego is. Klamath is in very Northern California in um, Del Norte County, right near Oregon. Um, so this is throughout the whole state. This, um, so Power Cycle is working to incorporate lessons learned from this first award cycle. So please stay tuned for opportunities to engage with that. Okay, so we are almost done with our prepared slides and I wanna take a moment for a more personal note, um, but from both Alex and myself, um, to thank you so much for inviting us to this conference and for your time today. It really is an honor to be sharing with those working every day, mitigating hunger and disrupting poverty. As I alluded to at the beginning, we've all been living through some pretty extreme headlines for some time now. I don't know about you, but part of what helps me get through is the inspiration from all of those others taking on these challenges and emergencies of the day, um, who either see them or transform them into an opportunity to work together for solutions to create a better world and sustainable, healthy communities tomorrow, whether F through work directly focused on climate change, hunger, or other health crises. So opportunities to come together and learn from each other like this today, even when we don't have the chance to be in the same room, are an important and inspiring reminder of that. So thank you again, not only for your attention today, but also for your efforts every day. Um, so we will now start from that to transition to next steps moving forward. So astute listeners might have noticed that I didn't give deadlines for applying to any of the grant programs I mentioned. Some of those might have even put that together with my saying that those are not continuously funded. This is because we don't currently have an open application period for any of them and are beholden to the state legislative budgeting process. So um, we are going to leave you with some breaking and exciting news. Just last week on Thursday, September 24th, Governor Newsom approved a large climate bill package with $15 billion in funding. In a press release, the Office of the Governor described the legislation as outlining investments to build wildfire and forest resilience, support immediate drought response and long-term water resilience, 
and directly protect communities across the state from multifaceted climate risks, including extreme heat and sea level rise. Some portion of that funding is for Cal Recycles programs. Since that only happened last week, I don't really have agency specifics yet for how that money will be implemented. Um, so I would strongly encourage you to look more into the details of those bills and also to stay tuned with us for funding opportunities and open grant applications that can either help you extend and innovate the important work of feeding people that you're all doing every day, as well as other opportunities to plug into the network of those working on climate solutions. So with ways to stay tuned, uh, I turn to Alex. Thank you, Shana. So I'll leave this slide up for some time in case anyone wants to write down the links or our emails, we can get some of this information to you. But CowerCycle has a couple of listservs that you can sign up for and get updates through your email. We have an organic materials listserv that kind of gives more overarching information. A greenhouse gas reduction grants listserv, which will update you with any upcoming cycles, as well as documents or hearing about upcoming grants, including um, any that will come from that recent signing by the governor as well as the short-lived climate pollutants listserv that will give you any updates about SB 1383 tools, webinars, or any other resources that Car Recycle um, comes out with. So thank you all so much for your time and uh, we'll take questions now that I believe Shelly will be moderating for us. Thank you so much, Shana and Alex. I wanted to just start by reading one of the comments. Um, Abdullah from ICNA Relief San Diego said that this is the best session. It's such practical information that helps our agencies who are not aware of available grants. So a big, huge thank you to you guys for bringing this to our hunger conference this year. Um, a next question for you guys. Shana, you mentioned that um, Cal Recycle has to measure, you know, how much the gas emissions from transportation to go pick up the food is really offsetting the the food going to the landfill right so there's always that environmental exchange of am i using more am i depleting the environment more to pick up the food and divert it from the landfill okay i'm sure you could go for 16 hours on to how this really works but at 30,000 foot level can you talk about the science behind cal recycle and and how how you go about measuring something like that? It just seems so large in scope. I would defer to my environmental scientist. <laughs> yeah, I can uh, try to answer that question. So in some past grant samples, it's dependent on the type of funding we get, so CCI funding and that cap and trade money. So to prove that we're kind of in, you know, the black of greenhouse gas emissions on our grants, we have a calculator that takes in how much food is being rescued or uh, prevented during that grant cycle against what type of equipment is being purchased, which is more specifically refrigeration or vehicles that are going to emit larger amounts of greenhouse gases. So um, we have a couple of calculators out there, and I think a couple of them are actually public tools that you can kind of play around with that have the amount of uh, greenhouse gas emissions by different types of vehicles, including like heavy duty trucks, to those smaller vans and larger refrigeration, like walk-in refrigerators versus like smaller refrigerators. Thank you so much. There must be so much measuring going into this. And I know our food pantries out there that are doing our fresh rescue picking up at the grocery stores, they, they are always weighing what's being recovered from the grocery stores and not going into the landfill. So that is always something on the minds of our agencies. Um, another thing that stood out to our audience was the community composting, right? The People, Food, and Land Inc. got over a million dollars in your grant funding, and it sounds like they're going to be doing subcontracts to 120 um, agencies all the way down to San Diego. Um, do you know anything beyond their target for who they're reaching out to to do the community composting? Are food pantries included in that? Are they targeting grocery stores or who really um, do they want to be subcontracting with? Um, that is a really great question. <laughs> Thank you, Shelley. So I am newer to working in the community composting program. I know they've worked with a lot of entities as sort of an um, in umbrella as a way to get that, that funding to those projects on the ground. And I would love to get more information um, back to, to whoever asked that. Um, and 
Also, I would encourage definitely folks to sign up to our listserv for opportunities to engage on, um, they might have suggestions on how we can best uh, engage with different communities and reach out to all different communities for any cycles we're able to award or application cycles we're able to award moving forward. So. Thank you so much. Um, I know when I saw the legislation for Senate Bill 1383, I, I was like, oh my gosh, there's going to be a ton of food coming to the Emergency Relief Network with us. And then my second thought was, oh my gosh, there's going to be a ton of food coming to our network. How are we going to handle this? Um, and it's been good, right? It's brought a lot of attention to the work that we've been doing for more than 40 years. And it's been making those connections from the donors to not give food to the landfill that's otherwise edible to humans. Um, sometimes there's a balance, right, between who's got to pay for, for what? Does the donor pay for the transportation of the food? Does the food pantry do it? A lot of our pantries on this um, call today don't have any budget, right? They, they're they using volunteers with their own cash, gas, their own vehicles to go pick up all of these donations. Um, I know that the grants you guys highlighted were pretty huge in equipment and scope. Um, and um, I've had the chance to see some of the work at, through Feeding San Diego and Jewish Family Service and Produce Good, um, but those were like the multi-thousands of dollars of grants. Um, do you guys offer different ranges of grants um, or is it all these large, large projects? Do you do smaller things? Uh, I can start speaking to that if you'd like, Sheena. Um, so there usually is like a minimum funding amount just because um, it's a lot of work to manage the different grants and we don't wanna have, you know, a hundred of them out there. So I think this last cycle, the minimum might've been 150,000. Um, and what they're asking funding for can range anything from one truck to four trucks to refrigeration to just equipment and um, technology that helps them just move everything a little bit faster. We did want to highlight specific San Diego County grantees, um, but we have them all over the state. And some of them are smaller agencies that uh, kind of share the wealth. Uh, with other smaller agencies, it, it's just so different across the state. You know, every single grant application is reviewed individually because it's not a one size fits all sort of solution. Yeah, and and for those of us in the audience, you may have remembered a couple of years ago when Feeding San Diego um, got the grant funding and then San Diego Food System Alliance did in partnership with San Diego Food Bank, we put out an RFP looking for those subcontractors, right? We bought several vehicles um, that wanted to do food rescue and then gave them to our agencies involved in food rescue. So if you have an idea, big or small, um, if, you, if you're not quite at the $150,000 grant proposal level, but you've got a great idea and you want maybe five other partners to come on board with it, contact us at the food bank with your idea and and we could potentially apply collaboratively to cal recycle funding um, get that larger grant buy multiple trucks build a, a bigger infrastructure and a bigger system to be recovering all of this food that's going to be coming our way um, and we really appreciate that that sometimes you guys offer continued grants and, and rolling cycles of grants because sometimes those ideas don't come today, but those ideas come in a, in a future cycle. So keep those innovations out there, you guys. Um, we are going to say goodbye to Alex and Shana um, and take a little lunch break. You have their contact information. Again, I will share it out at the end of the conference, but we have built in a 30 minute lunch break here in the conference. So feel free to step away from your computers for the next 30 minutes. I'll be rolling some of our nutrition videos 